Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, OVC Fiscal Year 2020, Expanding SANE Services to Victims of Sexual Assault on Campus, hosted by the Office for Victims of Crime. At this time, I am going to turn it over to our presenter today, Yvette Estrada, Victim Justice Program Specialist with the Office for Victims of Crime. Hello, everyone. My name is Yvette Estrada, and I'm the Program Specialist with the Office for Victims of Crime, OVC, within the Department of Justice. I just want to thank you all for joining today's webinar, especially when I know that many of you are in the process of adapting services and, and work environments in response to COVID-19. Before I begin, I'll share a little bit about me. I've been with the department for 15 years now. Uh, the last of those eight years have been with OVC. I oversee numerous grant programs focused specifically on human trafficking, sexual assault, domestic violence, and some telehealth, telemedicine initiatives. The OVC Sexual Assault Nurse Examiner programs fall under my grant portfolio. For today's webinar, I'll discuss the mission of DOJ and OVC, a breakdown of the solicitation. So if you have a copy of it with you, it might help to follow along and reference. For each slide, we've added page numbers on the top right side for your reference. I will talk about eligibility, program goals and objectives, some required documentation, application deadlines, award amounts, timelines, as well as the application review process and how to, how to apply. And then we'll follow up with questions and answers. The DOJ's mission is, well, this program furthers the department's mission by increasing the quality and quantity of services available to victims of sexual assault. A little bit about OVC. OVC was formally established in 1988 through an amendment to the 1984 Victims of Crime Act, known as VOCA. Its mission is to enhance nation's capacity to assist crime victims by providing leadership and funding on behalf of crime victims. OVC is charged by Congress with administering the Crime Victims, the crime victims Fund which supports the Crime Victims Compensation Programs and Victim Assistance Programs. The scope of this program, this can be found on page four of the solicitation. OVC seeking applications to establish or expand sexual assault nurse examiner same program that will offer medical forensic care, advocacy, and other victim services to sexual assault survivors on college campuses. Eligible applicants are, one, institutions of higher education, including tribal institutions of higher ed, and two, healthcare organizations serving institutions of, of higher education, such as campus hospitals and clinics. All recipients and subrecipients, including any for-profit organizations, must forego any profit or management fees only one application by any particular applicant entity will be considered. However, an entity may be proposed as a subrecipient or a subgrantee in more than one application. The primary goals of this program are, again, to establish or expand same programs that will improve the delivery of sexual assault, medical forensic care, advocacy, and other victim services to sexual assault survivors on campus using coordinated community response strategies, and two, building the campus's capacity to train and retain SANE. The objective of this program is to develop, expand, or strengthen SANE services on campus on campuses for victims of sexual assault to improve delivery of post-assault medical and advocacy services. To the extent possible, campuses should collaborate with victim service providers in their communities in which the institution is located. 
If appropriate victim service programs are not available in your community or, or, or are not accessible to students, campuses should, to the extent possible, provide a victim services program on campus or create a victim services program in collaboration with a, com a community-based organization. To accomplish some of these goals, we've, we've highlighted some activities that are allowable under this program. Uh, again, some activities are to establish or expand SANE or sexual assault response teams to align advocacy, medical, legal, and educational services for survivors, and ensure trauma-informed practices across service sectors. This may include hiring a SANE SAR coordinator to identify SANE and other campus personnel offering victim services. We strongly encourage using a SANE SAR model, which will allow institutions to, to implement national best practices in sexual assault response. Other allowable activities include developing, strengthening, strengthening and implementing SANE SAR policies, protocols, and services that effectively improve the response to sexual assault on campuses, and to develop collaborative relationships between community-based organizations and campus-based victim service providers that improve the quality of assistance provided to survivors. Other allowable activities include the training and mentoring of SANES and advocates, operational costs, including salaries and fringe benefits for program staff to train and mentor would be allowable costs under this program. Equipment costs are also allowable that could support SANE and advocacy services via technology, such as tele-SANE or tele-advocacy programs. Um, and other activities that are allowable are campus awareness and outreach efforts about the same program and provision of same services. The main deliverable under this program is the delivery of medical forensic care, advocacy, and other victim services to sexual assault survivors on campus. Other deliverables are providing trauma-informed care to survivors to prevent and minimize re-traumatization, improved quality of sexual assault med medical forensic exams, and sexual assault victim services provided to survivors, and survivor empowerment while holding more perpetrators accountable. There are some activities that cannot be supported under this program and are considered out of scope. One of those is tuition reimbursement in lieu of salary for projects staff, and any other activities that are not designed specifically to enhance sexual assault, medical forensic care, victim advocacy services, and SART coordination on campuses. There are some, OJP has, has um, discussed some priority areas in the solicitation, which I will highlight. OJP will give priority consideration to applications that address specific challenges that rural communities face, applications that demonstrate that individuals who are intended to benefit from the grant reside in high poverty areas or persistent poverty counties, and applications that offer enhancements to public safety and economically distressed communities, which are qualified opportunity zones. I'll talk a little bit about each of those three. So to receive priority consideration under the rural priority, applicants must describe what makes the geographic service area rural using U.S. Census or other appropriate government data. De describe how isolated the area is from needed services and how they will address specific challenges in rural communities. Applications received under the poverty priority area must demonstrate that individuals who are intended to benefit from the grant reside in high poverty areas or persistent poverty counties. 
High poverty area means any census tract with a poverty rate of at least 20%. And persistent poverty counties means any county that has had 20% or more of its population living in poverty over the past 30 years. Applicants under the Kiro Z priority must specify how the project will enhance public safety in, in those qualified opportunity zones. All of this can be found in the solicitation on pages five and six. And in the solicitation, there's also a link that will direct you to a current list of designated QOZs. So you can refer to these resources um, in the solicitation. The application deadline is 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time on May 7th, 2020. OJP urges applicants to submit applications at least 72 hours prior to the application due date to allow time for the applicant to receive validation messages or rejection notification from grants.gov and to correct in a timely fashion any problems that may have caused a rejection notification. At this time, the due date has not been extended, uh, but OJP is continuing to monitor this situation and will determine if additional adjustments to closing dates will be needed. So again, as of this time, the current deadline is May 7th, 2020. OVC expects to make no more than 16 awards under this program with $500,000 being the max amount awarded for each award. These will be three-year awards with a project start date of October 1st, 2020, and an end date of September 30th, 2023. No extensions are permitted to extend the project period since these, are, since these awards are funded un, under the provisions of VOCA. This means that OVC has no discretion to permit extensions of any awards period of performance beyond the statutory period. And all awards are subject to the availability of appropriated funds and to any modifications or additional requirements that may be imposed by law. OVC expects to make awards under the solicitation of grants, which is the legal instrument of financial assistance from our JP. OVC as the awarding agency will have the responsibility for oversight, monitoring, and the redirection of the project if necessary. This means that substantial involvement is not expected between OVC and the grant recipient when carrying out the activity contemplated in the award agreement. The benefit is that the grant recipient will have a great deal of autonomy although they still will be required to submit regular progress reports among other grant administrative requirements. This slide here is very important. Uh, it, it talks about the application elements. So I'll, I'll go through some of this information here. Um, the following application elements that must be included in your application are one, a project narrative, and two, a budget detail worksheet. These two documents must be submitted to meet the basic minimum requirements for your application to advance to peer review and receive consideration for funding. If you do not have these two documents included, these minimum two documents included in your application, then it will not be considered for, for funding. There's just no way around it. So please make sure you include the, pro the project narrative and budget detail worksheet. The program narrative is broken down into four separate sections. The first section is description of the issue, which is 20% of the application score. The second section is the project design and implementation plan, which includes goals and objectives. And this is 40% of the application score. The third section is the organizational capability and competency. This is 20% of the application score. And the fourth section is 
the plan for collecting the data required for this solicitation's performance measures. And this is 10% of the application score. The budget detail worksheet is worth 10% of the application score. And all these documents are referenced on pages 7 to 10 of the solicitation and described in detail. The review criteria that I mentioned is noted on page 12 as well for your reference. The program narrative format. Uh, the program narrative should not exceed 20 double-spaced pages in 12-point Times New, New Roman font with one-inch margin. So please adhere to the program narrative format requirements on page 8. I'll talk a little bit about the plan for collecting performance measurement data. Under this program, grant recipients will submit quarterly performance data in OVC's performance measurement tool, which we call the PMT. But for this section of the program narrative, applicants should demonstrate an understanding of the performance data reporting requirements and detail how they will gather the required data if they are funded. You do not need to submit performance data with your application. Again, this section is just your understanding of the performance data reporting requirements. The performance measures information is included as an alert that success, successful applicants will be required to submit performance data as part of the reporting requirements. If you're interested in reviewing the performance measures under this solicitation, there's a link on page 10 that you can refer to. The budget detail worksheet. Um, there's, there's a lot of detailed information about the budget detail worksheet, which can be found on page 10 of the solicitation. I will highlight that applicants should use the Excel version of OJP budget detail worksheet when completing your proposed budget, except in cases where you don't have access to Microsoft Excel or you experience technical difficulties. If you don't have access to Excel or you do have technical difficulties with the Excel version, then there is a PDF version that you can use, and, and it's, uh, you can find that in the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide. As a quick note, the budget detail worksheet and the budget narrative are combined in a single document. We refer to as the budget detail worksheet. So we do get a lot of questions about if those two are separate, but they are, they are combined in one single document. In your budget, personnel costs should relate to the key personnel for the project. You should break out costs by year, reflecting 36 months total of project activity. So you do not need to submit um, a proposed budget for one year. You, you want to make sure that it reflects 36 months total. You can, again, review the um, OJP Grant Application Resource Guide for more details on the budget detail worksheet. Applications must also include all of the items on this list. Um, I won't go through all, but there are a few on here that I will point out since they, do tr they will trigger a hold on your funds if they are not submitted. The disclosure of pending applications, and if you are charging indirect costs, you should have a current approved indirect cost rate agreement in your application. Um, so if these documents are, are, are not in your application, again, they will trigger a hold on funds. A couple of other items that I'll highlight are the submission of job, job descriptions, resumes, and, and a timeline. There is a great checklist at the end of the solicitation that can help you when developing your application. It can be found on pages 16 to 17. When completing the application for federal assistance, known as the SF-424, the grant management system, which is GMS, takes information from the applicant's profile to populate the fields on the SF-424 form. 
So an applicant with a current active award must ensure that a GMS profile is current. If the profile is not current, the applicant should submit a grant adjustment notice updating the information on its GMS profile prior to applying. Make sure that the amount of federal funding requested on the SF-424 matches what you are requesting in your budget. Again, your budget should match the SF-424 total. You should also make sure that the that the individual identified as the authorized representative on the form is someone who has the authority to accept a federal award and all of its obligations on behalf of your organization or your tribe. Um, for, non, for some nonprofits, this is usually the executive director. Um, for universities, that, that, that can vary depending on the department. But again, um, make sure that this person has authority to accept the federal award. First time applicants should attach official legal documents to their application. For example, articles of incorporation, 501c3 status documentation, or organizational letterhead to confirm the legal name, address, and employee identification number entered into the SF-424. And as a reminder for current OJP grantees, if your tribe or organization has had a change in its legal name or mailing address since you last received your award, you'll need to submit a grant adjustment notice to update that information as soon as possible so that we are aware of these changes. How to apply. Applicants must register in and submit applications through grants.gov. Uh, which is the primary source to find federal funding opportunities and apply for funding. You can find information on how to apply in response to this solicitation in the OJP Grant Application Resource Guide. There are a lot of steps in the registration process, so I cannot stress enough to start early. Again, applications are due May 7th by 11.59 p.m. Eastern Time, and we encourage you to get your applications at least 72 hours prior to the due date. If you have any technical difficulties, you'll, you can reach out to the Grants.gov customer support hotline for assistance. Grants.gov. Um, registering with Grants.gov is a one-time process. However, please know that there can be processing delays and it can take several weeks for first-time registrants to receive confirmation of registration and a user password. We encourage applicants to register several weeks before the application submission deadline. Additionally, OJP urges applicants to submit applications at least 72 hours prior to the application due date. Here's some important information about SAM registration since we tend to get a lot of our uh, questions about this. Once your SAM registration is active, you will be able to, to complete the grants.gov registration. The information transfer from SAM to grants.gov to grants can take as long as 48 hours. Therefore, we recommend that the applicant register or renew registration with SAM as early as possible. Within 60 days of the SAM registration activation, any applicant for an OJP award creating a new entity registration or updating or renewing a registration in SAM.gov must submit an original sign notarized letter to SAM appointing the authorized entity administrator. Notarized letters must be submitted via the U.S. Postal Service mail. Failure to submit this notarized letter within 60 days of SAM registration activation may result in the registration no longer being active. So again, Organizations must update or renew their SAM registration at least once a year to maintain active status. 
we inserted this slide here because we get a lot of questions about the review process. Uh, OVC may use internal peer reviewers, external peer reviewers, or a combination to assess applications on technical merit using the solicitation's review criteria. Peer reviewers will review the application submitted under this solicitation that meets basic minimum requirements, some of which are the application was submitted by an eligible type of applicant, the funding request was within the funding constraints, and the application was responsive to the scope of the solicitation. Federal award notification information. Award notification will be made by September 30th, 2020. <clears throat> These notifications are made via email through the grant management system to the individuals listed in the application as the point of contact and the authorizing official. In the award notification email will be detailed instructions on how to access and view the award documents. And it will include steps to take in GMS to start the award acceptance process. These awards have a lot of special conditions and legal requirements, so please read through them carefully before accepting the award. Um, when it comes to attachments, we recommend that you use descriptive names when, when labeling attachments. This helps OVC, this helps our peer reviewers uh, locate specific attachments that um, that need to be reviewed. So the more descriptive you can be with your attachments, the better. Um, we'd recommend, again, at the end of the solicitation is a checklist. You can follow the names of those attachments accordingly and, and, and label them accordingly. Adding attachments. Uh, Grants.gov has two categories of files for attachments, mandatory and optional. Um, we receive all files attached in both categories, but we recommend to not embed mandatory attachments with another file. Um, in other words, it, if you include all of your attachments under one file, for example, it, the, the attachments labeled all other requirements or all other attachments, it's really hard, again, to locate specific attachments. So we do not recommend that you embed mandatory attachments with other files. Um, page two has a lot of details about adding attachments, so you can refer to that. Um, with technical problems and requests for late submissions, the following conditions generally are insufficient to justify late submissions. That is failure to register in SAM or grants.gov in sufficient time, failure to follow grants.gov instructions on how to register and apply, failure to follow each instruction in the OJP solicitation on how to apply, and technical issues with the applicant's computer. Any applicant that experiences unforeseen grants.gov technical issues beyond its control that prevent it from submitting its application by the deadline must email the National Criminal Justice Reference Service, which is NCJRS, the Sponsor Center, within 24 hours after the application deadline to request approval to submit its application. On page two of the solicitation in the OJP grant application resource guide, there's detailed instructions on how to do it. Um, but in short, the applicant must describe the technical difficulty, must include a timeline of the applicant's submission efforts, com um, the complete grant application, the applicant's DUNS number, and any grants.gov help desk or SAM tracking numbers. All of that information must be included in your email to NCJRS when requesting approval to submit a late application. Final tip, again, there are lots of steps, so please start early. 
Okay, well, until we get to the next slide, again, I just want to stress that there are a lot of steps to start early. Um, make sure to apply under the correct competition ID number, which is OVC-2020-18113. Um, applications are due May 7th by 11.59 p.m. Again, submit your applications at least 72 hours prior to the due date. Use the budget detail worksheet template as required. Um, ask for the amount of funding needed, so you don't need to request the max, just only what is needed for your program. And if you have any technical difficulties, call the grants.gov customer support hotline. Hi, um, Yvette, thank you so much, and sorry about that. Um, I was unable to move the slides and um, could not unmute myself to tell you that until now. <laughs> no problem. Um, anyway, so I will take it in through here. We have a couple more I'm sorry, I think I'm having some technical problems. It looked like my screen um, blanked out and the slide moved and now, um, so I apologize, give me a moment to um, kind of get back to where we are supposed to be. Um, so at this time, before we go into questions and answers, I want to go over a couple more slides and wrap that up. Um, in order to stay connected with OVC, you can subscribe to their email service, and we have a new feature called Text to Subscribe. You can send a text message to OB, OVC, I'm sorry, excuse me, OJP, OVC, insert your email address, and send that to 468-311. Please note that message and data rates may apply. You can also go to their OVC website and subscribe to their email um, newsletter um, from the website. We also ask that you please follow OVC um, on social media. They do have a presence on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. Um, again, um, Yvette, had, I've, Yvette had mentioned this, you can seek out solicitation support through the National Criminal Justice Reference Service. So we are going to try to answer every single phone or question that came through today, but if for some reason we are unable and we run out of time and can't answer your question, you can reach out to NCGRS, or if your question comes up later on, you can reach out to them. They are available at www.ncjrs.gov. You can call them at 851-3420. That's 1-800-851-3420. And email them at grants at ncjrs.gov. They also have a web chat feature that's available, and they are open 10 to 6 Monday through Friday until 8 p.m. the day the solicitation closes. Um, but as mentioned previously, it is highly recommended that you submit your application at least 72 hours in advance. Um, lastly, on this slide, um, NCGRS does have a series of emails, and you can sign up to receive Just Info, which comes out bi-monthly, or new funding news from NCGRS that comes out each Friday. Funding news from NCGRS will announce any new solicitation and grant opportunity from the Office of Justice Program, so not just OVC. They will also notify you when there are webinars, such as this one, re related to a grant opportunity, and notify you when those, that information has been posted to the agency's websites. As previously mentioned, um, grants.gov is where you need to go if you are having technical problems with submitting your application or any of the associated attachments. They are um, available at their 800 number, 800. 518-4726 or at 606-545-5035. Grants.gov is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but they are closed on federal holidays. You may also email them at support at grants.gov. 
Lastly, we have a series of um, emails, or excuse me, URLs that may be beneficial to you. Most of these have been mentioned throughout the presentation, but this is one slide that you can go to and look at them. Um, as previously mentioned, the OVC website is ovc.gov. We also have highlighted on this slide OGP Grant Application Resource Guide, the DOJ Grants Financial Guide, and the Budget Detailed Worksheet. So the links to all those items are listed there. At this time, now we will go into questions and answers, and I will revert back to the other slides that I mentioned, and some of that information will also be added to the chat box, so you can go ahead and copy and paste that um, into a Word file. Um, also, as a reminder, the slides, the transcript, and the recording for this webinar will be posted to the OVC website in approximately five to seven business days. Also, before we get into the questions, questions, please submit them to the chat box. That is located under the radio button with the three dots and send them to all presenters. Please do not submit your questions, I'm sorry, submit your questions to the Q&A box and address them all to all presenters. Do not submit your questions to the chat box. All right, the um, first question is, is a hospital not located on a campus nor part of an institution of higher education, but rather serves local institutions of a higher education eligible to apply. Sorry, Mary Jo, I was on mute here. Can you repeat that again? Sure. Um, is a hospital that is not located on a campus, nor is it part of an institution of higher education, but it does serve local institutions of higher education eligible to apply? I would say yes, as it is serving the institution. As long as it is serving the institution, yes. Uh, is a community health system that has a SANE program eligible to apply for this grant? A community health system? So, That's how the question is worded, correct? Yes, if they're a, a health care organization that is serving an institution, then yes. All right. Would a state agency be able to apply, like a state SANE coordinator who would work with different regions in the state? State agencies are not eligible to apply. However, they could work with that institution of higher ed um, to partner with. So the institution of higher ed could partner with the state agency that is that is um, that has hired the same coordinator. So the state agency would not be eligible to apply, but the institution of higher education could and partner with the state agency. If that makes sense. If our organization currently receives VOCA funding through our state, can we apply for this grant to expand our same program to local universities? So it sounds like they are not an institution of higher education. Um, did they say what what their organization is? No, it just um, no. they they are receiving VOCA funding through the state, um, and they want to expand their same program to local universities. They do not indicate what their current organization is. So the, if the person that submitted that question could um, identify their organization, and if they are an organization that serves an institute of higher education, that would be appreciated. Are renovation costs an allowable expense, expense for example, to um, renovate an existing health office by SANE certified, to be SANE certified? It would depend on what those costs. I know there is some guidance that allows for um, some of these costs, but I think it has to do with increasing the accessibility um, of of the dedicated space. So I can, if that if that person can reach out to me through NCJRS, I'd be happy to find that guidance for them so that they have um, when preparing their application and budget. 
but that one that one depends. So this next question is re, um, regarding the po poverty priority areas. Um, is the campus location where students reside that should be described as high po excuse me high poverty, um, or is there permanent resident area or both? Okay. Can you read it one more time? That one's a little confusing. Yeah, um, it, I guess uh, basically, are they look? Do you need to look at the campus location where the student resides and identify that as a high poverty area, or I think what they're asking is, do you want the air, the res, the permanent address of the student that's being served, or is it both addresses to be determined for the po poverty area? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I'm not too familiar with 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 that. If, if I think that one I'm going to have to refer to NCJRS, but they can email them and I'd be happy to provide a little bit more guidance on that. For I'd individuals, be happy to do that. Uh, sorry. For individuals who are intended to benefit from the grant, can this include a description of campus individuals as well as community individuals? I'm not sure what they're asking here. I believe they want to see if they can serve in addition to campus, those that are in the community perhaps. For individuals who are intended to benefit from the grant, can this include a description of campus individuals as well as community individuals? Well, the scope is really for students. It's for it's for sexual assault survivors on campuses. So I would I would stick with with that since that is the scope of the of the solicitation. If we have multiple campuses that may fit in different priorities, how do we address that? Um, I, the, the question is not phrased completely. Um, if we have multiple campuses that may fit in different of these priorities, how do we address that? That's a great question. Um, that's a really good question because they may have they may apply, apply, yeah, it could fall under each of those priority areas. Um, I, would, I would probably recommend just identifying which campuses would fall under the priority area that they're considering and then just provide documentation to support that campus's priority area. So they can describe that in their in their application, which campuses would apply for each of those, for whatever priority area that they're considering, and then just provide the documentation as an attachment to that application. Hopefully that makes sense. What is the time task plan? The time task plan is a chart or it can be a table that highlights your goals and objectives, as well as the people that are responsible for completing tasks to achieve those program to achieve those goals and objectives. So it should um, it should again just talk about um, the goals, the objectives, the tasks, uh, the the timeline, as well as the people responsible for accomplishing those tasks. Can we provide information about cost sharing in the application even though a match is not required? Yes, you can. And there is no match for this project, but yes, you can. Does each budget have to have an equal amount of money or can the amounts be different across the years as long as the total amount is 500000 or less? Each year can have a different amount. So the three year, so each year does not have to be an equal amount. Um, what we typically see are, you know, costs 
in year one are generally higher since a lot of folks, since that's when most folks are, are getting their program up and running. So year one costs tend to generally be higher, whereas year two and year three may be somewhat lower. So no, they do not have to be um, divided among three years. Um, again, a couple of questions came through about the slides. Um, everything will be posted to the OVC website in approximately five to seven business days. That would include the slides, a power, sorry, the slides, a transcript, as well as a recording. Um, and we will notify you via email when that has been done. Also, somebody asked for a link to the solicitation. And that link, I am going to go ahead and post that into the chat box here right now, and I will send it to everybody. Um, sorry, I am in the wrong box. Give me a second. I will send this. Um, so the link to the solicitation will be available for everybody in the chat box. Although, Michelle, it looks like my chat box is not working. Um, so. Give me a second and I will, um, I will get that to you. I apologize for the delay there. Um, is, there uh, is this solicitation available or offered annually? Um, we don't know what our appropriations are for next year, so I, it's, it's hard to say whether this will be uh, competed again for fiscal year 2021. Do the SAE have to be provided to students on campuses? Our community hospital provides the SAE in the hospitals. I'm wondering, will the hospitals be able to apply for these funds? The medical forensic exam, again, the, the, the purpose of the program is to es establish or expand the same program on campus, so the goal here is to increase the availability of trained and certified students on campuses, but again, if, if, if that cannot be done, then the university should partner with community-based organizations so that sexual assault survivors on campuses can receive medical forensic care off, off campus through, through a community-based organization. So the goal is that we would hope students can receive care on campus, but if, if, if that cannot be done, then we ask that um, campuses partner with victim service providers in the community so that it can be done in the community. Can SANE and a forensic nurse examiner be used interchangeably? I would, I would say so, yes. Yeah. I work for a nonprofit organization and we have a clinic to perform sexual assault evidence collection exams. We have partnered with many of the local colleges and universities to be a resource for them with victims of sexual assault and rape. Could we apply for this grant? It sounds like they would be eligible, yes. Do campuses have to hire a SANE or SART coordinator as a college employee, or can campuses do sub-awards with community groups? They could do either. Under this program, it can be done either way. You could hire that same start coordinator as, a, as an employee or partner with a coordinator in the community and use a, and, and, and fund that position through a sub-award, so both ways. Can we provide information, of, okay, this question was already asked earlier. How can I check if my SAM application is up to date? Uh, that's a great question. I believe there is a SAM uh, customer support line that you could probably reach out to to verify that. 
If a SANE SART program already exists um, for a county that we serve, the higher education campus, would we still be able to apply for this grant? If so they are, if, so are they looking to expand that program? I think I would that would be the key, key question. Yeah. They, it sounds like they already have one, um, and they want to see if they can apply for this one. I would say if, if the goal is to expand the program, then you could be eligible for this. Um, again, I would I would just caution on 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 duplicating any services under this program. So, if the goal is to expand the same program, then yes. Our college is in a high poverty area, yet a lot of the students are not from the immediate area, but may come from um, a persistent poverty county. Would we still be able to qualify as a poverty area? So, I think it as long college, as, yeah. yeah, it's saying that the college is in a high poverty area, and then saying that the students um, are, yet the students are not from the immediate area, but they may come from a poverty area. I would say that they would just need to provide sufficient, um, and, uh, sufficient narrative explanation just to talk about how they, they would qualify for a high poverty area or if, if they are in a, a, yeah, or if they're, yeah, I, I think they would just have to really discuss that in the narrative. And, you know, for Mary Jo, I just want to say, you know, I, these, these priority areas um, can be a little challenging. So if, if applicants want to email me about whether they would qualify for a high poverty area or, a or you know, a persistent poverty county, um, or if, you know, if they want to apply under a, a, a rural community, um, they can reach out to NCJRS and, and I'd be happy to um, work with them to see if, if they, if they would um, receive this consideration. The existing county does not have a victim services, but the adjoining county does. Would, this, would new victim services programs be expected or would be received by all reviewers to work with existing victim services? Not. Mary, that, that one? Yeah, that one's I'll, I'll repeat it again. Um, I'm gonna read it verbatim. The existing county does not have victim services, but the adjoining county does. It is rural. Would new victims, would new victim programs be expected or would be received well by reviewers to work with existing victim services? I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. I'm not sure how to address that. All right, um, if that person could maybe um, send in a clarifying question, um, we can try to address that a little later. Could a university near another university with the same program apply either as a new site or as an expansion? How does proximity to other SANE sites factor into decision making? That's a good question. I, I would say that we, um, Again, the, the scope of the project is to expand or develop the same program. So I think as long as the applicant can speak to that and, and then also discuss that there, you know, there may be existing same programs in the area and how they would coordinate with those programs, I think that might be um, a good way to address that. But they, they certainly could apply because they would fall under the scope of the program, which is to um, develop or expand a same program on campus. Um, and Yvette, I wanted to let you know, we are at 202 right now. We do have quite a few questions um, remaining to be uh, um, responded to. 
Um, would you like to continue on for another minute or two, or um, should the people just um, reach out to NCJRS at this point? If they can reach out to NCJRS, that'd be great. Okay. All right, so um, at this time we are, as I mentioned, um, a few minutes over the 2 o'clock hour, which is the official ending time of the webinar. Um, we apologize that we were not able to get to everybody's question, but we really appreciate your interest and time. And so please send your information to the National Criminal Justice Reference Service, or your questions rather, and they will work with a vet to get an answer to you. You can reach them at grants at ncjrs.gov. Again, that is grants at ncjrs.gov. You can also find that information as well as their um, 800 number, 1-800-851-3420. On page two of the solicitation. So on behalf of um, OVC and Yvette, thank you very much for attending today's webinar.